Hello and welcome to another episode of the Quite Frankly podcast. And quite frankly, it might be one of the most personal episodes that I've ever had. If you are somebody who's new to this channel, get ready because this is the one episode where I'm going to lay it all out as much as I can for this moment right now. And if you're not new, then you've seen that for almost a decade now, I've been pretty open, pretty vulnerable with videos about Kundalini, about third eye, about forgiveness, and all kinds of other topics. But in this one, I'm actually talking to you one-on-one, -on -one, where I don't have to create a space for the guests to feel like it's their platform and they can share their knowledge and information and wisdom while I sit back as an observer. In this one, I'm sharing with you things that I know. And I say things that I know for a very specific reason. Because a lot of creators, a lot of teachers will read a book and then they'll translate it for you. They'll read a book about manifestation. They'll read a book about yoga or whatever. Uh, hey, you know, three ways to blah, blah, blah. But it's borrowed information. They don't know it. They read it. They know it logically. They don't know it experientially. And I'm not knocking anybody down, by the way. Some of those videos have helped me. Some of those videos might be even more helpful for you where you are right now than this one. Because there are these creators who will make, you know, five videos a week. Nobody, nobody is an expert in five topics a week, hundreds a month, hundreds a year. Nobody. They're digging so many small holes, but they haven't dug one hole super deep. And so I say that to let you know that those videos are important because maybe one of them is about kundalini yoga for example and then you go oh i'm curious about that and you start going down the path of kundalini because of this one creator and that so that serves a purpose and it's an amazing thing but what i'm doing today is i'm going to share with you only the direct knowledge that i personally have experienced myself i'll put down my my tea one last sip. This is actually, uh, it's Blue Lotus tea. If you don't know about Blue Lotus, Blue Lotus is an incredibly sacred plant with a, with a storied history, mostly in ancient Egypt, to help you quietly dance between dimensions. It's fully legal, and it's a very subtle energy. You almost miss it. If you're not fully paying attention, you might miss it. But if you give yourself fully, it's there and it's powerful. Mm. I intuitively reached for the Blue Lotus today, wanting to quietly straddle these two worlds in this reality and beyond the veil while I make this video. It's really important, and I'll start there, with following your intuition when you feel something strongly. Yesterday I woke up, I jumped out of bed and made cacao. I haven't had cacao in six months and I needed to have not just cacao, not chocolate milk. I needed to have a dense cup of frothy, milky cacao, heart opening cacao. And I don't know why, it was my first thought when I woke up. I get to later lunch with a few friends and one of them says, oh yeah, we were just in Santa Barbara yesterday. We had a cacao ceremony. And then somebody follows me on Instagram, sends me a nice note saying, I'd love to send you some of our cacao. So something was going on with cacao. Then last night, it was about 10 p.m. And I'm normally in bed by 10 p.m. But I had this feeling you need to do cupping on your left arm. So I said, OK, all right, I know better than to get logical and to question my intuition. It says cupping. So something needs to happen with cupping. So as I'm cupping, I do a Google search about uh, cupping specifically uh, around the moon cycle because yesterday was the full moon. So I wrote cupping moon cycles in Google. 
And what came up is the best days, according to Islamic culture, according to the Prophet Muhammad, the best three days to do cupping is the 13th, 17th, and the 21st. Yesterday, when I did it, it was the 21st. And the, it went on to say, it's best to do it right after a full moon. And yesterday was right after the full moon. Follow your intuition. There's an, a waterfall, a waterfall of wisdom available to you at all times. It's there. It's there. And then your brain goes, oh, I don't know, copying? It's 10 p.m. I need it. No, do it. It's telling you for a reason. Just do it. See what happens. Uh, one thing that happened where I was reminded of that is last year I went to Spain and it was really not a time when I should be going to Spain. I was busy. I could not take a week off, but I did. My body, my, no, not my body, not at all, not my body. My intuition said, go to Spain. So I said, okay. And I went to Spain. I get in my rental car when, when I got there and I literally pulled over. I was staying at a friend's villa in Mallorca, the island of Mallorca. And on the way there, I was like five minutes away. I pull over and I'm yelling and pleading with my angels. I'm like, are you kidding me? What am I really doing here? Why am I in Spain? Why am I in Mallorca? What am I doing? And then I'm starting to see all these um, license plates, 38, 38, 38, 38. And 38 is when my angels want me to know. Like, stop, you're on the right path. Stop questioning, you know, you're in the right place. So I'm like, okay. And now through that mutual friend, I made so many friends, like they're like family now. And two of them in particular were launching a brand together, tentatively, hopefully. And it's all because I went to Spain because my intuition told me to. It might be life-changing. It might be the thing that changed my entire life because I went to Spain. Follow your intuition. Follow your intuition. I just gave you three quick stories from just the recent history. This happens every day. Every day I'm surprised by something new that happens because I followed my intuition. This podcast is only happening. I've never in two seasons done a solo podcast a solo cast. I'm only doing it because I'm trusting my intuition. Maybe you need to hear this right now. I'll give you one last example. I had an astrology reading last week with an incredible Vedic astrologer. I've been watching his YouTube videos. He's actually going to be on the podcast. It's coming out in a few weeks. And we did a session and I said, can you check? Can you do astro cartography and, and kind of see where I'm supposed to be living? And my plan, so you know ahead of time, is that I'm moving to Europe next year. I have three cities bookmarked in my phone right now. Madrid, Florence, and Marrakesh. I've been looking at these very specific properties in Marrakesh, Florence, and Madrid. The astrologer sent me a list of about 20 places in the world where I would be the most happy, most prosperous, where I would find my liberation. And three of them he underlined. Madrid, Florence, and Marrakesh. All right, follow your intuition if you get nothing else from that. Now, I also want to tell you, uh, if you've been listening to the podcast, thank you so much. My God, thank you so much. It's been an awakening for me in so many ways, an awakening for you guys in so many ways, and even for the people working on the podcast. I'll give you a quick little example. My camera guy, my director, my filmmaker, he's incredible. I won't say his name just in case. But he uh, was with me and we shot an episode with Nidhi. She is in a, in a Ayurvedic practitioner and a Ayurvedic doctor or a doctor of Ayurvedic medicine. And she's going to be on the show in a few weeks. I've just screened the episode and it's incredible. There's so much information in that. But one of the things that she said in the episode is that she, she quoted 
Khalil Gibran, Khalil Gibran, who wrote The Prophet. And she very specifically quoted that the children, you know, they come from you, but they're not for you. And it was a beautiful passage. And when we finished the episode and they left, my, my, my film director said, Frank, uh, that was my favorite episode you've ever shot. And he said, specifically when she quoted Khalil Gibran, it flashed me back, he said, to when my mother would read the, uh, the uh, no, sorry, she would sing a song to us. And he said, and that line she quoted was in the song. And he says, this is a very distinct memory in my mind. And I said, well, you know, it's from The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. And he uh, had never heard of it, but I said, you know what, let me gift you the book, because I love the book. It never leaves my nightstand. I went and got the book and I gave it to him. He opened the book and there was only one page, guys. Listen to this. There was only one page in the entire book that had been earmarked. And it was what that woman had quoted on my show. And he reads it and he says, Frank, this is the song. This is the song my mom used to sing to me. It was the entire, she used to sing that entire passage to him. So I gave him the book and you know, there's so much there. I hope you didn't miss it because that's not a coincidence. That's actually a lot of things happening. There's so many layers and dimensions to what was going on there. A healing took place. A frequency from that song was something from his childhood that needed to be recalled back in that moment. He read it and it was like a completion in him and he needed to have that book. And that's why I gave him the book. The fact that that was the only page earmarked, the fact that she brought up the book, the fact that his mom used to sing that to him, there are layers of things happening. And that is why life is the ceremony. I love plant medicines. I've worked with ayahuasca. I've worked with psilocybin. I've worked with a lot with blue lotus and all kinds of medicine. But life is the ceremony and you are the medicine. I'm sorry if I'm too serious. I, you know, like when I talk to my friends and everybody and I'm playful and I'm fun and I love all that. I love life. I love life. I'll look at the clouds. I look at, I lay on my back and I look at the clouds and I'm drenched in, in tears, in tears from pleasure, from joy. I love life. I love taking things playfully. But when I talk about this stuff, for some reason I get so serious because I'm like, are you hearing it? Are you listening? Do you understand how deep this is? I think that if you're watching this video, you do understand. And I hope that you'll not skip even a second of this video. Go to the end. Because I'm going to hit so many topics and one of them is going to be like, ding, 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 ding. That was for me. That was for you. There was a woman on the show named Gaia, Gayatri from Soul 33. And she said, Frank, when you turn 38, you're going to start doing miracles for people. For those of you who don't know, I'm an energy worker. You can check out my website. A lot of times it feels like a miracle. A lot of the things that happen, my clients will have uh, anxiety where they can't even go out onto the street. They have back pain. They have a need for surgery. They have all kinds of things. They have heartache and they can't get into a new relationship, whatever it is. And then they'll email me and they'll be like, I don't understand. It's, it's gone. But it's not yet to the point I feel where it is actually a miracle getting birthed. Not yet. Yeah, you know what I mean there? And so what I'm going to do is tell you this quick little story. And then I'm actually going to, I just had this thought. I'm going to like read you a few things that I've been answering for, uh, Oh, I'm excited now. Yeah, that I answered on, on Instagram. Um, yesterday, people just asked me a ton of questions and I started answering them. And I'm going to read those to you and, and maybe there's something there for you too. Because if, if they're asking it, it's in the collective consciousness. So there's something in there that you're going to want, if that makes sense. You'll, you'll understand when I, when I get to that. But really quickly, let me tell you um, that, you know, she, she said you're going to be birthing these miracles the way a mother births uh, a child where it's not of you, it's of God, but you'll be the vessel for it. 
And so if you don't know yet, do check out my website. If there's anything I can do to help you, I think the next available is in a few months, um, but it'll be divine timing. It'll be perfect for you, I promise. And, and she said, you'll be, you'll, you know, you'll be birthing these miracles, but that you have to embrace the name that you had when you were in a healer in ancient Persia and your name in that life was Firas. She didn't know and no one knew at the time that my birth name in this life is Firas. And all my clients now, all my friends, my family, they call me Firas because I want to embody that name. But I can't change the name of the podcast. It's too late now. It's quite frankly, it's not, you know, it won't make sense if it's quite Firasli. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. I know I said the Instagram thing, but I'm actually going to save that to the end where, I, well, where I'll read to you my answers to certain questions because something else just came to my mind that I really want to share. When you're watching this episode, there is a frequency that's being transmitted. So when you're watching this, yes, you're hearing it. It's in English. Underneath it, there's the language of light. Underneath it, my throat chakra, my heart chakra, my essence is going to be transmitted to you and you will uh, pick, pick up the subtle energies. You know, when you see, like, for example, I have the gurus behind me. There's Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, Guru Dev. There is Meem Karoli Baba. There's Hanuman. You can't see him, but my hands are always on his feet. Always. And then there's Sadhguru. Sadhguru is the kriya that I, uh, I, 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 is the practice that I do. I do his kriya. But I get so much from Sri Sri Ravi Shankar and from Neem Kroli Baba and all my other gurus. But, you know, uh, there's a video also, if you check out my Instagram and also YouTube, Spotify, Apple, all of that, with Sadhguru and with Dr. Daniel Amen, who's incredible. And the three of us posted this thing where I had a brain, my brain scanned after not meditating for 30 days, I stopped my practice and then they scanned my brain and then I meditated again. And two weeks later, we scanned my brain again and all the holes, all the low blood flow, all the low activity was gone in the after. It was a vibrant brain just two weeks later. But anyway, I want to say, I brought up the gurus to say that the reason I have their pictures in my home is not because of, oh my God, devotion, you know, touching their feet. And that's what kind of turns people off, I think, in the West, that we're worshiping these people. That's not what it is. Their photo, because of the state of being that they operate from, that they live in, that they are, their photo itself carries a transmission. It carries a frequency, a vibration. And I have felt it ever since I've brought it into my home. And so when you're watching this, there's a vibration, there's a transmission, there's an energy exchange beyond the words. Hey, I just really quickly want to tell you about the necklace that I'm wearing. You might see me wearing it in a lot of these episodes. I actually give it to many of the guests too. They're from Lila Quantum Technology and as you can see, there are little capsules inside that are supercharged with what they call quantum energy. And it's just like walking around with one of the full-sized infinity blocks with you wherever you go. So you can get those on the website too and be quantumly upgraded wherever you go. But in the words, there's power too. Gaia, the same healer I told you about, who by the way, I've sent at least 30 people to and all of them have had extraordinary experiences. Some of them have shared with me and I just am mind blown and others have not shared, but they said they would just write like, had my session, wow, still processing or unbelievable or whatever, you know? And one thing that she said to me, she said in my session with her, you're going to write a book and it will be in English, but behind it will be the language of, of light. And as people read the book, they will be receiving a transmission and I love that. And, I, and I, I wanna convey that to you in this video as well. And when I was not into spirituality at all in this lifetime, you know, cause I, I was for lifetimes and that's why I'm where I'm at right now. But in this lifetime, I started out not very into spirituality. Yes, I was very sensitive. Yes, my dreams always came true. Yes, even my parents and teachers would be like, what did you dream about today? But I was not, necessarily spiritual. I wanted to be an actor. I want, I was very in the material. And when I was 18, 
I'm driving with a friend and we see a sign on a house and it said psychic readings inside. And we were like, whatever, let's go, let's do it. We went in spontaneously and this woman grabs my hand. She had already told me at this point so many things about my life that nobody would know. She grabs my hand and at this point I'm scared. My hand is, my palm was sweating because she grabbed it intensely. And she goes, what is it that you know? What is it that you know? And I was like, I don't know. What do you mean? And she goes, you're going to write a book and it's going to change a lot of lives. You're going to teach people something. What do you know? And I'm like this dumb 18 year old kid. Like, I don't know. What are you talking about, lady? Leave me alone. I just want to have fun, you know? And now I get it. Now, age 35, I get it. I'm like, ah, okay. I got it. Mm. So, you know, of course, my, I go from there into wanting to be an actor. But what happened is that I went to college and I fell in love with journalism and with storytelling. But in my personal life, I was visiting shamans. I was going to monasteries. I was meeting Gregorian monks. I was meeting Buddhist monks. I was going to temples. I had a private audience with the biggest gurus in the world. Deepak Chopra, Sadhguru, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, many others, many others. And I couldn't deny it anymore. So I created this YouTube channel. I start making videos. Some of them were getting millions of views because I was documenting people's third eye abilities. And I learned it myself. You can see that in the third eye playlist, but we would literally blindfold people and they could still see everything. Kids, adults, eventually blind people, 100% fully certified blind people. And we would on top of that blindfold them and they could see everything. They could beat me in a game of pool, bowling. I would put them through obstacles. What does that tell you? Going back to the very beginning, follow your intuition. That is just an intuitive thing that, that has been shut down because no one ever told you you could do it. No one ever taught you to rely on your, in, your intuition. They said critical thinking, think critically, complex. And as a journalist, I was doing amazing. I mean, look right over there, four Emmys. <laughs> Four Emmys. I was at Dancing with the Stars. I was at the Oscars. I was at the biggest natural disasters in the world. I was interviewing presidents. I was interviewing royalty. I was interviewing everyday heroes. I was at the front lines of the biggest stories nationally and in the world. But a part of me was longing. It was yearning to embrace the spiritual side that I had put away for so long. And so I started to do energy work. I started to work with people. I learned so many techniques from so many people. I strengthened my intuition. And then I took a leap and I thought, what if I just did only this? And I was scared. It took a couple of years to leave my job, to leave my colleagues who had become family. It's scary. It's like all I knew. I was literally working at Good Morning America, at ABC News, at Nightline 2020, like the entire ABC News division since I was in college, 12 years. And then I left. And guess what happened? I was working with about six people a month doing emotional, mental, spiritual energy work. And then I left my job and within a couple of weeks, my wait list jumped to like three or four months. And now four years later, I think it is three or four, it has not slowed down and I've never advertised. So that brings us right here. It brings me here right now, wanting so desperately to share with you on a deeper level, man, God, 
so much devotion I have to you, to the people I meet. Because, you know, when you're creating, it can be lonely, especially in the spiritual world where you're like, you know, it's a very niche thing. And um, then I'll go somewhere. Like I went, I went to the store a few days ago and the cashier was like, I told her she had beautiful eyes. She did. And she was like, oh my God, YouTube. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And she was like, I'm going to do my first plant medicine ceremony this year because I watched your videos. Like, you know, and then I was with, I was at a restaurant with my friends and the waiter recognized me and said a similar thing. And then, you know, there's like all these different countless examples of that where I'm like, oh, this is reaching people. Okay. All right. Got it. Cause you know, it's easy to forget when you're like at home by yourself. Oh, okay. People are watching this. Okay, good. They're getting it. Yes. It's resonating. Like, that's all I want. All I want is for people Sorry, I just like, if I'm not careful, I'll, I'll cry very easily because I love you so much. And it's, uh, it's like, um, it's like, it can be, it can be fixed, but you like it broken. I'm going to say that again. It can be fixed, but you like it broken. That's going to be triggering and maybe upsetting to some people. But all I see, which is why I'm so isolated is because all I see is all these untrained minds, unfocused minds. And I was like that. So I'm not, there's no judgment for a very long time where you're just believing every thought that you have. And then you're saying it out loud. I'll have friends message me and they're like, I don't like this place or that place. Oh, this happened. And I'm like, why are you just sharing your thoughts with me? Your scattered thoughts. Stop believing your mind. I love the mind. The mind is making sure that I don't jump off a cliff or that I don't get mad at somebody and, you know, break my finger and throw it at them. Like it's meant for that only though. While you're here, yes, utilize the mind for survival. And that's it. Stop believing it. Stop listening to it. Stop thinking beyond anything that you are it. Befriend your mind, fine. But subdue your mind. Okay, so all I want, like all I want, is for you guys to wake up with me. Wake up with me. I'm speaking so from my heart right now. Always, but really, really right now. Because I love you. I love you. Okay? And I want you to look in the mirror and say, I love you. I want you to look at old pictures of yourself when you were five years old and say, I love you so much. I am so sorry that I forgot about you. I know you're still there inside, just wanting a big hug and for someone to tell you that you're okay. And I'm telling you that I'm telling you that right now, I love you and you are okay. You're better than okay. You are that, the ultimate, the highest. And you've been conditioned to forget. And when I say you, I don't mean you, the body. No, no, no. That's a fleeting thing. 
that we love, we honor. It's our vehicle and our vessel, but it is not you. When I say you are the highest, I mean that part of you that you share with God. Not just the part of you that is one with God. No, no, no. The part of you that is God. Just like there's the sun and then all the light rays, but those light rays are still part of the sun. Those, those light rays still are the sun. They're extensions of it, and therefore they are it. So yes, God, creator, everything. But you are a light ray from that thing. And so you are that thing. And it's arrogant to say that you are not. It's humble. It is true humility to say, I am the light of the world because God says I am. And it's arrogant to say that you're not because then you're saying you know better than God what you are. How dare you? How dare you say that you know better than God what you are? What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say? Come on, tell me. The thing that he said that everybody forgets. You can do this and more. You can do what I can do and more. So, what are you going to do with that? Hmm? I have a morning practice that involves like a Kriya Yoga, meditation, prayer, gratitude journaling, self-reflection, self-inquiry. I don't know. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm asking you, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Tell me. Write it in the comment if you want. Hey, did you know that you're walking around like a radio tower just broadcasting out these messages and frequencies on a subconscious level and some of those broadcasts are negative and they could be affecting the way people see you the way people treat you did you also know that you're never upset for the reason that you think you're upset we're also walking around with these trapped emotions trapped old traumas from things that have happened to us in our past and that's what I clear for people when they come and work with me one-on-one. -on -one. We look for the subconscious blocks that are affecting you, and I clear them. Most people report the next day, if not that same day, they feel lighter, they feel happier, they feel free. And a lot of times, you can check out the testimonials on my website to see people resolve physical illnesses and physical traumas like restless leg syndrome, eye pressure problems, cold feet, cold hands, anxiety. All of these things are things that I've seen get cleared when people work with me. It's all done on an energetic level. And the best part is that it's done remotely from the comfort of your home. We just get on a Zoom call. And in 30 minutes, you can experience what feels like 10 years of therapy. So if you're curious, go to www.frankellaridi.com and I cannot wait to work with you. Anyway, anyway, bueno, bueno, bueno. It can be fixed, but you like it broken. Your mind likes it broken. Because the mind here, I'll tell you something that's from one of my favorite books. It's, it's called A Course in Miracles. And the mind, it says, will search for spirituality. It'll search for truth endlessly under one condition. You must never find it. Because if you find it, it's over. It's just like you can be drunk in the street and your parents will say, oh my God, it's my, my baby, come back home, I love you. You can, you can do all kinds of things. You can steal from a bank and your parents will say, we forgive you. If you were going through hard times, you could have just asked. We would have taken care of you. My baby, I love you. But you say you're going to a yoga retreat. You say you're going to work with ayahuasca. See the reaction. No, oh my God, don't. Because then they know, then they know you're gone. They've lost you. There's no coming back. Once you've seen beyond the veil, that's it. And they might not be ready to wake up. And they're like, no, no, stay here, stay here. Because they, they think if you wake up, that might, they either they have lost you or it means that they're going to have to wake up too. And some people are really enjoying the slumber. I'm getting these messages. Did you hear this happen? Do you hear this candidate? This, this, I'm like, guys, 
I don't even respond anymore because it's just all these untrained, unfocused minds. It's okay to be involved. Yes, be involved in life, fine. Go, you know, like your candidate, do whatever, fine. Yes, okay. I'm not mad at that. I'm not doing it, but I'm not mad at it. However, don't give them your power so much where you think this person is your life and death. This person is your liberation. Nobody can give you liberation except for you. The guru will light your path. The spiritual teacher will light your path, but none of them are going to give it to you. They will find you when you are ready to receive it because you have created the space to receive it. That's all I'm going to say for now. Uh, I'm going to read you some of these questions that I got on Instagram and what my answer was. Oh my God. Okay. As I'm opening it right now, there's 21 new questions. I'm not going to read those. I'm only going to read the ones that have already come through. Um, so let's see some of them. And, I'll, uh, and, and I wrote a very spontaneous answer to all of these. So this is not like a researched answer. This is what I read, what I felt that needed to be transmitted is what I wrote. First thing, speak to us about the meaning of life. Ooh, big one to start with, huh? We've been asking that for thousands of years. My answer might surprise you. I wrote, life is meaningless. The mind searches endlessly for meaning in everything. A person waves at you on the street and your mind thinks, who is that? What do they want? Do I know them? All that from a simple wave. What to say about everything else in life? That's how spirally your mind went from a wave from a stranger. The purpose of life? Nothing. It just happened. A spontaneous bang, a roar, a sprouting of everything from absolute nothingness. It's meant to be lived and experienced and explored and absorbed and taken in, not to be investigated or figured out. The mind wants to figure it out because it thinks it'll help it survive, but spirit knows that life is just meant to be experienced and lived with full involvement in full potentiality. From this space, even looking at a tree could make a grown man cry. Somebody responded to that and said, this was the most amazing thing for the human mind you're speaking of to read. And I wrote, use the mind to dissolve the mind. Okay. A lot of people saying that I'm cute. Thank you. <laughs> they like my sweater. Thank you. Let's get to some questions though. Okay, here we go. I'm getting more creative with my manifestations. There's so much I want to experience. Where do I start? And I wrote manifesting is like utilizing spirituality to serve your ego. I just came out of a 90 minute massage and I did as I was reading it. <laughs> and I had the most profound realization or remembrance that there's nothing we need to do. Cause I was in the massage and I'm like, Oh, I need to remember to do this, to do that, to do that. And then I just realized what my mind was doing. It was creating lists as I was getting a massage. You don't need to do anything at all. Even meditating is too much doing, but it helps us realize that, which is why it's so amazing. When Osho was asked what happened when he first awakened, he said, I laughed and I laughed and I laughed because I realized I had spent so many lifetimes doing, seeking, searching, meditating, all this and all that, but there's nothing you need to do. It was always there. Enlightenment was there all along. I just needed to realize it. That's what he said. And I love that. I started laughing when I, when I read that. Somebody wrote, um, I'm craving a modality to explore. Maybe Vedic astrology or any other ones you have shared or spoken about. What do you recommend and from who? And I wrote, I love this. Uh, a Course in Miracles, Daily Kriya Yoga, Walk Barefoot on the Earth at least 20 minutes a day, a few days a week. Somebody wrote, what advice or reminder would you be willing to share for someone who does spiritual healing and cleansing work, cleansing work on themselves? And I said, there's always more. <laughs> there's so many layers. That's what I learned as a healer. There's so many layers. There's always more until you're fully awakened and liberated. 
somebody wrote, this is very sweet, somebody wrote, wow, I can feel the clarity speaking through you and I love it. My questions have dissolved. And I wrote, I love that. Just being, just be, dissolving into everything and into nothing. The mind has questions and what the sages knew is that we can, uh, I, I realized I made a typo there, oh well. Um, what the sages knew is that we can use the mind to dissolve the mind, just like the ancient washers used dirt to dissolve dirt from clothing. So I don't know if you know this, but in ancient Rome, maybe in India too, but in Rome, they would use dirt to get dirt out of clothes. It was like a beautiful technique, like use soil and silt to clean the clothes. Same thing, use the mind to dissolve the mind. Yeah, it can be a tool, like utilize your mind to dissolve the mind. How mantras, how questioning deeper and deeper. Who am I? Where did I come from? Okay, what about before that? But what is time? I don't understand. And just go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay, um, I had to, I had to uh, fix that typo. It was bothering me. Somebody said, do you feel a new awakening happening in America? How do you think it will pan out better or worse than people are expecting? I think it'll be better. I think it's going to be hard for a while. Uh, it's going to be hard for the next few years, but that's what happens. The storm clears things out for the sun to shine through. And we need both the sun and the storm in order for plants and everything to grow, for life to flourish. There's a lot more I can say, but it would be a whole video on that topic alone about what's coming, what to expect. There's videos, one with Princess Martha and Shaman Durek, one with Gaia, and one I think with Robert Edward Grant. And all three of those, we talk about what's coming, what's happening. One with Joni Patree, she's an astrologer. So if you go through my playlist of the Quite Frankly podcast, you're going to get a wealth of knowledge and you will be prepared for 2024, 2025, beyond, beyond, beyond. Somebody said, do you think we are a gateway to a new beginning on this planet? And some people say that ascension or they'll use other words. I think some of us came here to awaken and to help other people's awaken. I feel the earth is awakening or ascending, I should say. And we in bodily form are the microbiome of the earth. So we ascend, of course, with it. Right now, all around me, there are the frequencies of abundance and inner peace. You can have that and more. So take a second and let me tell you about Quantum Upgrade. Let's talk about like the Quantum Upgrade dashboard so people can see sort of how it works. We use a very complicated, sophisticated system, which is, as far as we know, the most powerful source out there for quantum energy on Earth. You can pick from like, I think 26, 28 different frequencies now that we have. Inner peace, which you could leverage at night, for example. A lot of people do that. Yeah. We have the Olympic performance. We have even something like weight management. We have the abundance, prosperity. The service actually starts. Like within five minutes, the energy you will notice it starts ramping up. In the dashboard, you can select the Hawkins level for the day and pick between a level from 500 to I think like 1,200 or something like that. Just start low, you know, go on 600 because it's not about faster, stronger, more powerful. Best is what feels good to you. Like men's booster, women's booster, inflammation support, testosterone testosterone booster. It's activating that testosterone actually can increase again. And five of these studies and it showed in 46% to 100% acceleration in wound healing. We do have a free trial that we want to offer all your listeners. And so code frankly, you get 15 day free trial. Yeah, there's a lot of really good questions here. A lot of really good things. I think I'm going to stop it there. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave you with something. Please, if you made it this far, do not stop right now. This is going to be the way I end the video. It's going to be what I wrote last night. And yes, it is a couple of pages long, but it's so deep and it all was sparked. Believe it or not. Listen to this. This is how I want you to know that life is a ceremony and how I want you to start interacting with life, witnessing it and interacting with it. Okay. My cat in one simple move last night inspired all of this. So listen, and you're going to see the entire thing is about devotion. In Hinduism, Lord Hanuman is revered. 
the epitome of dharma. His heart, oh, by the way, if you don't know what dharma means, it's like your personal and the ultimate purpose. His heart overflowed with unwavering devotion to Lord Ram. Hanuman, the son of the wind god Vayu, embodied boundless strength, wisdom, and humility, dedicating every action to his beloved Ram. His devotion is pure, his heart steadfast, and his service unceasing, offering a divine example of bhakti, or devotion, for all souls seeking the path of righteousness. In the great epic Ramayana, during the period of exile, Lord Ram's beloved wife Sita was abducted by the demon king Ravana and taken to his kingdom of Lanka, which some people believe now is Sri Lanka. Upon learning of this grave misfortune, Lord Ram was consumed by sorrow and the search for Sita became a paramount task. Hanuman, the divine devotee, was entrusted with the mission of locating Sita and conveying Ram's message to her that he's coming for her. He's coming to save her. His journey began with an incredible leap from the southern coast of India to the island of Lanka with the blessing of his father Vayu and the strength that de derived from his devotion. See, the strength of his devotion allowed him to hop over the ocean. Hanuman soared across the ocean, overcoming countless obstacles and dangers. Upon reaching Lanka, Hanuman faced the mighty demon army of Ravana, yet he remained undeterred driven solely by his love for Ram and his desire to fulfill the mission. Disguised as a small monkey, he entered Ravana's palace and amidst the grandeur of the demon king's court, he found Sita in a state of despair. With utmost reverence, Hanuman approached her, offering her comfort and hope. He revealed his true form, displaying his divine stature and assured her that Ram was coming to rescue her. To demonstrate the truth of his words, Hanuman presented Sita with, the Ram, with Ram's signet ring, a token of their bond. Overwhelmed by relief and joy, Sita entrusted Hanuman with a message for Ram, conveying her unwavering faith and devotion. Stick with me here because this is about to get deep, deep. Before departing, Hanuman's devotion manifested in a powerful act. He accepted the challenge of Ravana's emiss uh, emissaries who sought to subdue him. In a display of divine prowess, Hanuman allowed himself to be captured only to break free effortlessly. His demonstrations of strength and commitment and courage became legendary. He then returned to Ram with Sita's message, and detailed the state of Lanka, preparing Ram for the ensuing battle. Through this grand adventure, Hanuman's devotion and dedication illuminated his role as a divine servant. What made him a lord, what made him revered, what made him a god, what made him a deity, what made him a hero, what made him all of these things is that he was a servant to the divine. That's all I am. That's all I ever want to be. His actions not only affirmed his love for Ram, but also inspired generations to follow the path of selfless service and unwavering faith. This is the part now of what inspired this whole thing. My cat, an American short hair named Sebastian, reminded me of this today in his subtle display of reverence and devotion. Oftentimes, when I squat down to put down his food, he completely disregards the food and starts rubbing his head into my hand. The hand that's carrying the food, but he starts rubbing it. Sometimes the only way I can get him to eat is to put the food in my hand, not the bowl. Because his only interest in life when he's not sleeping is his affection for me. If I want him to eat because it's been all day and he hasn't eaten, I put the food in my hand and he immediately goes for it. If it comes from my hand, then he wants it. This is Hanuman's example for us all as well. He is only interested in anything in the world if it's of Ram or from Ram. Otherwise, he doesn't care. He doesn't want it. He doesn't care about luxuries of the world. He doesn't care about anything. He'll accept it only if it comes from Ram. Otherwise, he doesn't want it. He wants nothing that's not from Lord Ram. 
So in more modern times, the widely revered Indian saint Neem Karoli Baba, who's behind me, pictured behind me, he exemplified profound devotion, echoing the spirit of Hanuman. In fact, many of his devotees believe that Neem Karoli Baba was an incarnation, a student, or an embodiment of Lord Hanuman himself. As recounted in Ram Dass's book, Miracles of Love, Neem Karoli Baba's devotion to the divine was unparalleled. One such story tells of a time when a young boy suffering from a severe illness was brought to him. The boy's parents had tried every possible treatment, but nothing seemed to help. In their depression, in their desperation, I should say, they sought Neem Karoli Baba's blessing. And the saint, known for his compassion, simply took the boy in his arms and whispered a prayer to Ram. Miraculously, the boy's condition began to improve immediately and he soon recovered completely. This incident, among others, showcased Neem Karoli Baba's devotion, his connection with the un an unwavering faith in Lord Ram, which is very reminiscent of Hanuman's pure devotion. Through these stories, we see that true devotion transcends time, culture, and even species. Right? Because Hanuman is a mon monkey god. He's a monkey. Neem Karoli Baba is a human. Lord Ram is a deity. Sebastian is a cat. <laughs> and I don't know what I am. An alien, probably. And that's one of the reasons. And I'm sorry that I'm reading, but I wrote this all down last night. Obviously, you can tell it's a lot. One of the reasons why Christmas is such a beautiful time wherever, in, wherever it's celebrated in the world is because we witness a whole season when devotion is expressed in the form of service to others. Churches, organizations, and people in general brim with generosity, their hearts open and their hands giving. In these moments of service, there is a temporary dissolving of the boundaries that keep us apart. Mother Teresa, another great saint, walked this path. Her life was a testament to complete surrender, a dance of trust in the divine. She seemingly offered herself wholly to a higher purpose, something greater than herself, living not only for herself, but for the essence of love and oneness that binds us all. This is more here that I wrote. In the cobbled streets of Kolkata, where the scent of jasmine mingles with the clamor of life, devotion wore a humble sari and spoke the language of love. For many, Mother Teresa was not merely a woman born, a, uh, sorry, was not nearly a woman, but a living testament to the divine alchemy of faith and action. In the sweltering heat of India's summers, she moved like a whisper of grace, touching the untouchable and loving the unloved. In the pages of Catherine Spink's authorized biography, Mother Teresa, a complete authorized bio biography. We find a story that illuminates the profound simplicity and boundless compassion that defined her existence. One evening, as the city bustled with its, uh, with its usual fervor, Mother Teresa and her sisters found a woman lying in the gutter, neglected and left to die. Without hesitation, Mother Teresa knelt beside her, her small frame casting a shadow of solace over the woman's broken body. By the way, I'm paraphrasing. This is not, uh, I, this is not from the book. It's, it's a story from the book, but I'm retelling it in my own words. She lifted the frail, suffering woman and carried her to Nirmal Hride, the home for the dying, where she and her sisters tended to the woman's wounds, cleaning and dressing them with meticulous care. With hands accustomed to both prayer and toil, Mother Teresa cleansed the wounds, each touch a testament to her unwavering devotion. She whispered words of comfort, not in the tones of sermons, but in the soft cadence of a mother soothing her child. Her care was not a spectacle, but a sacrament. Each act of service, a verse in her living litany of love. As the woman lay dying, Mother Teresa held her hand, her presence a beacon of love and dignity. She saw beauty where others saw decay, and hope where others saw despair. 
This story, like so many others in Spink's account, is not just about a saint tending to the dying, but about the essence of devotion itself. It is about a woman who turned her life into a hymn, each note resonating with the divine. Mother Teresa, her legacy, is a reminder that true devotion transcends rituals and doctrines. It is found in the quiet acts of love that light the darkest moments. In her own words, not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. And in those small things, in those acts of devotion, Mother Teresa gave us a glimpse into the divine. Devotion... I'm going to end it here. This is the last thing. Stick with me, guys. This is the last thing I'm saying, okay? Devotion is not just a thing of rituals or religious practices. It runs deeper and quieter, like the murmur of movement beneath the earth. It is the cultivation of an inner state, a heart space, where each action and each thought is surrendered to something greater, something divine. It is not only in the grand gestures, but in the tender, everyday moments where true devotion breathes. If you are a volunteer, for example, okay, you're a volunteer accountant at a church, even the mundane act of inputting data into an Excel sheet can be a holy act of devotion when it's done with the intention to serve something greater than yourself. Guys, I love you so much. Thank you for bearing with me. You're a real one. If you stuck with me to the end, you are a real one. And I'm so grateful for you. I love you. Please go back and watch some episodes, okay? There's some recent things from Quite Frankly Podcast, which is only on season two, but it's very exciting. And then there's also some older videos, Third Eye Playlist, Kundalini Playlist, interviews with Gregorian Christian monks and with Hindu masters. It's all of it. It's there. I love you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you for bearing with me. Okay, if there's anything you want to see, if there's anyone you want to see me interview, any topic you want me to explore or delve into, please leave it in the comments below. Be nice to each other. Train your mind. Bring it back here. It's going to go like this. To the left, to the right, to the left, to the right. Bring it back. Bring it back. Bring it back. Somebody goes, yeah, but this president, this candidate. Just bring it back. Bring it back. Don't let it pull you. Don't let it pull you with, with them. Let them go where they need to go. Don't go with them. Bring it back. Bring it back. Bring it back. I love you.